So um, title of my talk today is frequently asked questions around anticoagulation in primary care for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation and very much the perspective will be from that of healthcare professionals working uh, in primary care. So these are my uh, declarations. So I've, I suspect I may not need to persuade the audience of the, the importance of um, stroke prevention uh, in atrial fibrillation and the focus around cardiovascular disease and atrial fibrillation. But just a, a quick resume or justification um, for this talk. So we, we, we know that AF uh, increases the risk of stroke significantly fivefold um increase um here on this slide it suggests that it's responsible for 20 percent of strokes though um more recent registries probably suggest that that figure may be even higher heading up to 30 percent and we know that um anticoagulation um reduces the risk of stroke very very significantly by up to two-thirds but we also know there's there's a significant mor morbidity and mortality related to uh, atrial fibrillation related strokes we know that with an af related stroke mortality is doubled and that 25 percent of people who have an af related stroke will not survive and in over half that population with a, an af related stroke um, there will be severe there'll be moderate or severe disability as a consequence and it's very costly um, to the NHS budget. Um, I think one important point, and I hope that this comes out of the talk today, that the benefits of anticoagulation significantly outweigh the risks in by far the majority um, of patients. And we should really, particularly in primary care, be taking a holistic approach to the needs of our patients with atrial fibrillation, um, addressing modifiable bleeding risk factors to allow safe anticoagulation. We know that PPIs are frequently underused in this population and should be considered where there is a high risk of, of bleeding. We also know that um, hypertension commonly coexists um, uh, alongside atrial fibrillation as does abnormalities in lipids and other um, significant factors such as smoking and being overweight. Um, and these should all be, be addressed routinely to re reduce the risk of any form of vascular disease, whether it be affecting your coronary arteries, um, your, your cerebral circulation or um, your peripheral arteries. So, we often use the term from talking about stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. We use this term non-valvular atrial fibrillation. I, I think it's quite a confusing term, um, uh, not least for primary care. So it sounds as though um, uh, people who we will be considering for anticoagulation should not have valve disease, but nothing could be further from uh, the truth. So here, many of you will be familiar with chance fast scoring. It's how we assess that level of um, risk of ischemic stroke in a relation. And you can see the qualification. This is the most recent nice to offer anticoagulation um, with a DOAC, a direct acting oral, oral anticoagulant in people with non-valvular AF, where the CHADS fast score is uh, two or greater, and obviously taking into account the uh, risk of bleeding. So what is non-valvular atrial fibrillation referred to? It's a, it's a term that's widely used within the ni NICE technology appraisals for the individual um, direct oral anticoagulants. Um, it's defined as uh, Atrial, so non-valvular atrial fibrillation excludes two particular um, uh, patient cohorts. That's those who have rheumatic moderate or severe mitral stenosis, or those with a mechanical prosthetic heart valve. Um, and the reason by and large for this was that these 
particular groups of patients were excluded from the major randomized control trials in each um, uh, where each of the individual DOACs were compared to warfarin. But of course, it is confusing. And if you read the ESC guideline of 220, they suggest that the term non-valvular atrial fibrillation should uh, be dropped because it's in it's confusing. And some have proposed a new acronym, uh, acronym MARMAF, um, uh, which is Mechanical and Rheumatic MARMAF. And you can see on the hand side of the screen where uh, one of the, the co-authors was Professor John Cam around what is valvular atrial fibrillation. I'm just going to highlight um, uh, what was a meta-analysis, which actually looked at the phase three randomized control trials of DOAC versus warfarin and looked at those with valvular um, heart disease. And you can see those trials in the top left hand uh, table, rely with the Bigotrin, Rocket AF, with Riva, Roxaban, Aristotle with Apixaban and um, Engage Timmy with Edoxaban. And they looked at specific groups of valvular heart disease subtypes, but of course, um, not included was uh, moderate to severe mitral stenosis. And if you then look at the outcomes of the meta-analysis based upon ischemic stroke or systemic embolism or major bleeding, where uh, the DOACs or NOACs were compared to the VKAs, um, looking at patients who had valvular heart disease in the groups that I've just described. Just remember that we've excluded moderate to severe um, mitral stenosis. You can see that um, the benefits of having a DOAC over warfarin was um, sustained as it was in general in these randomized control trials. Many will be aware that uh, the ESC, uh, the Invictus trial, was published, which looked in a little more detail at, at people with rheumatic heart disease and atrial fibrillation, and looked at two separate populations. One uh, looked at sort of um, uh, rivaroxaban versus uh, the use of um, warfarin, and by and large, this is because um, of this term, non-valvular atrial fibrillation, and the exclusion of those with moderate or severe um mitral stenosis from um, that group. So the study population had to have one or more of the following. So their chance fast score had to be raised. Uh, they are mo uh, moderate to severe mitral stenosis, uh, left atrial spontaneous echo contrast or left atrial thrombus. And the primary outcome was a composite. So stroke, systemic embolism, myocardial infarction or death from a vascular or unknown cause. And the results were interesting, if not um, anticipated. So the, the primary um, outcome actually occurred in more patients in the rivaroxaban uh, group. So they did less well than those patients who were given warfarin. Um, the major, uh, sorry, the rates of major bleeding didn't occur significantly. So to an extent, this gives some weight behind um, the, the current guidance that we should not be including this group of moderate to severe mitral stenosis in the group to whom we would give a DOAC. I mean, there, there are some um, points that we should take into account within the Invictus trial. It was, it did have a proportion of patients who also had mild mitral stenosis um, within it, I think something like 30%. But I think um, uh, based on this, there's little reason to change the um, current approach we, we um, have to anticoagulation in patients with valvular heart disease. Just thinking about mechanical heart valves, and it's important to differentiate between mechanical and bioprosthetic. Um, an old study now that looked at the bigotrin versus warfarin. Um, uh, and in this patient group, they looked at either first thromboembolic event, you can see that, that uh, on the uh, left hand side graph of first bleeding event. And you can see um, that in both uh, cases, um, uh, warfarin was actually better than the bigotrin. Um, and either protecting against stroke 
or um, uh, protecting against that first um, bleed. And we know that within this group of patients, the INR that we tend to use when we're using um, warfarin tends to be higher. So perhaps it shouldn't be, or it shouldn't at the time it was published, be a complete surprise to us. So in patients with valvular heart disease, other than um, moderate or severe mitral stenosis or mechanical heart valves and DOACs are recommended um, uh, for the evidence I've just suggested. The definitions of valvular and non-valvular um, AF are misleading. Um, and again, the use of DOACs should be permitted in most patients with valvular heart disease. And I uh, suggested that there's a, the term marm -AF could be useful to identify the true high-risk AF patients for whom VKAs, warfarin, uh, are the anticoagulant of choice. So moving on, which patients should not start or be switched to a DOAC? Just going to move that there. So these are the groupings. It's, it's not exhaustive. So we've mentioned prosthetic mechanical valves. We've talked about moderate to severe mitral stenosis. Many will be aware that um, uh, we should not in those with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or at least we should seek advice about that. Uh, um, people who are pregnant, breastfeeding or planning a pregnancy shouldn't be switched to DOAC. Where there's interacting drugs, although often when we see interacting uh, drugs that are likely to interact with DOACs or a, a person's taking drugs that are likely to interact with a DOAC, equally, they are frequently just as likely to interact with warfarin. Um, but of course, with warfarin, at least we have the benefit of uh, having an INR, which will give some guidance around their level of anticoagulation. And the other group are those where a higher INR um, than standard range of two to three is actually being um, used. There are caveats around uh, renal impairments, so creatinine clearance less than 15. But again, we are seeing many of our renal physicians actually using drugs down at this uh, level of severe um, uh, kidney disease. But we would not suggest from a primary care perspective that we, um, we should not be um, initiating uh, the use of DOACs in this particular group. Um, some patients, and I'll touch on this perhaps later, are, are on um, multiple antithrombotic therapies. They may be on one or two antiplatelets plus warfarin. And in those particular groups, uh, a discussion with either a cardiologist um, or an anticoagulant specialist would be appropriate. And of course, there are also patients who have venous thrombosis at unusual sites, uh, portal vein thrombosis. And again, these are patients that we should not automatically consider swapping from um, uh, warfarin over to a DOAC. But again, they, we need um, that specialist advice in those particular patients. So in terms of identifying patients with um, atrial fibrillation, um, can we use an event recorder or some other form of ECG technology to diagnose AF or do should we always um, have a 12 lead ECG? And again, you may be aware there's a, there's a lot of discussion goes on around whether you can, um, uh, in someone who presents with palpitations and you use, say, a lead one um, device, I mean, typically it's a, a cardiac device, there is a six lead equivalent um, uh, that you can use these days, you know, based on finding atrial fibrillation um, using um, that device, should we feel um, confident in being able to anticoagulate uh, an individual who on assessment is at high risk um, having uh, made that diagnosis or potentially using that device? So many again will be familiar with the, the most recent NICE guideline, um, which is very much focused around um, patients with an irregular pulse. Um, on a manual check, and then the need to do a 12-lead ECG. If the 12-lead ECG shows 
um, atrial fibrillation, um, then um, that clearly will support going on and looking at stroke risk, um, etc. But in a proportion of patients, that 12 lead ECG uh, is in essence normal. It doesn't show atrial fibrillation, but we are suspicious that the individual who's presented to us has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. They may have symptoms, intermittent palpitations, and we've not as yet got 12 lead confirmation that they have atrial fibrillation. So if they are having palpitations, then those palpitations are occurring more frequently than um, over a 24 hour um, period of time, then a 24 hour ambulatory monitoring is what has been recommended. Um, where we have someone where, who is having less frequent palpitations um, than uh, once a day, once every 24 hours, then some form of ambulatory ECG monitoring event recorder or other technology would be appropriate for that um, period. Now, although that's, that is the current um, NICE guidance, it has been some what um, probably based upon a nice menu of cardiac devices, which was published this year, and I'll come to that um, as appropriate. So here's your 12 lead ECG. Um, you cannot see any evidence here of clear P waves. There is in some areas hint of that irregular um, uh, baseline. Um, uh, consistent with fibrillatory um, waves and you can see that the gaps between the R waves, the spikes or the S waves is, is irregular and this is uh, atrial fibrillation. So where are the opportunities for, for detecting um, atrial fibrillation. We, we know that one of the consequences of COVID and um, COVID clinics and flu vaccination um, clinics is that increasingly um, uh, there is pulse checking and monitor and, and where irregular pulses are identified. Uh, devices such as cardiac devices are being used to uh, assess as to whether someone has atrial fibrillation. We know that community pharmacy are, are very much involved in doing checks around blood pressure and hypertension. And again, that presents an opportunity to check pulse if it's irregular, to use um, some form of um, technology to uh, assess in more detail. And the list is not exhaustive, but increasingly now we have people who are being identified as having atrial fibrillation using um, again, such devices such as cardio devices in podiatry where um, foot pulse checks are being done and um, uh, the pulse is found to be irregular. Um, there's a reading on the lead one um, device and it, and it suggests atrial fibrillation. So all sorts of opportunities for actually detecting atrial fibrillation. And we know that when atrial fibrillation has been pre present um, for a long time, and particularly often in that older population, um, they may not be aware that they've actually got palpitations or, 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 or they may not have palpitations and not, not aware of having an irregular pulse. This is the um, cardiac event recorder. Um, it comes in two forms. It's a, it's a lead one device or a, a, a lead six device. So you get the, the six standard leads on the more option, the, the, the more modern um, uh, form of the cardiac device. Um, and as one might anticipate, more expensive um, uh, device. And as you can see, the quality often from a lead one um, ECG it's very good, as you can see from here. And again, it clearly shows the changes I described earlier that you would see in, in atrial fibrillation. So uh, we've added to the bottom of the, the nice clinical guideline uh, diagnosis pathway at the bottom. You see the, pop, the, the box in blue. And this is the re recently um, published MTG around the use of cardia mobile, um, which is now uh, recommended as an option for detecting AF in people with suspected paroxysmal uh, AF, again, who are presenting with palpitations and referred for ambulatory um, monitoring. And in fact, um, if you have time to read um, that guideline, it suggests that um, using a cardiovascular device 
is more cost effective than um, using 24 hour ECG uh, monitoring. So if it's good enough to use in paroxysmal AF to make the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, should it be good enough to make that diagnosis when patients present in routine surgery where we don't have access to a 12 lead ECG and where we want to try and make sure we are not missing uh, uh, um, you know, a diagnosis. We, you know, many of us have had that experience where someone's presented with atri what we think, what, what is an irregular pulse, we're suspicious that it's atrial fibrillation. And by the time we've done the 12 lead ECG or arranged it 20 minutes, 30 minutes later in the practice, they're back in a normal rhythm. Um, so these are the ESC220. Um, guidance around AF, very much, you know, um, influenced by the COVID pandemic at the time. Um, and the recommendations are that those with a, a raised um, or high chance fast score um, who have atrial fibrillation for greater than 30 seconds on a single lead tracing. Um, and, and that's where you have a physician who has expertise in reading ECGs or ECG rhythm interpretation um, and can make a definitive diagnosis, then um, we should consider where we have that single, single lead confirmation that uh, we, should, we, we should consider anticoagulating that high risk individual. It doesn't mean you don't need to do a 12 lead ECG and anyone with atrial fibrillation, you should do a 12 lead ECG anyway. But um, we shouldn't allow the delay, and often that delay can go into days or weeks within primary care and doing the child lead ECG. We shouldn't allow that delay um, to mean that we are not anticoagulating that individual earlier, where we have confirmation that they have atrial fibrillation on a lead one um, uh, device. Okay. So significance of stroke or bleeding risk score. So you'll be familiar with Chad's FASC, um, the scoring that we use to identify people at high risk of, of uh, stroke. You'll also be um, familiar either with the Hasblad bleeding score or the, the um, more recently recommended Orbit bleeding score. And they have as a consequence an actual score, an added up score. And one of the um, challenges that we have seen certainly amongst healthcare professionals in, in primary care who are assessing stroke risk versus bleeding risk score, that they often see that you, they, they, they often compare the actual um, stroke risk score with the bleeding risk score. And so if you've got a chance of asking three and a half, has bled a three, um, uh, it, it, some people interpret that as meaning there's no overall benefit overall benefit, but nothing could be further from the truth. So in considering anticoagulation in someone who's at, at high risk, um, we have to assess the benefits versus what the risks are. So stroke risk versus bleeding risk, as you can see here. Here's a chance for score. Depending on the score, the adjusted um, one year risk of having a stroke, if you've got a um, a Chad's fast score of um, nine can go up to 15% in one year, a huge level of um, uh, risk. But NICE also, of course, recommends that we should um, be assessing bleeding risk. Um, so we should assess it when we're starting anticoagulation and we should be assessing it when we're reviewing people who are anticoagulating, and we should be at least reviewing um, people annually who are anticoagulated. Um, they recommend now that we use the orbit bleeding risk score for the reasons that you can see here. Um, they say it has a higher accuracy in uh, predicting absolute bleeding risk than other tools. But we know within practices that it is other, other tools that are actually being um, used and has been is embedded in many primary care software systems and we know it's going to take time for Orbit to um, actually appear as the alternative within primary care um, uh, software systems. And I think this statement at the bottom is, is really quite important. So we should be discussing the benefits and the risks of anticoagulation um, uh, and in most cases by far the ma majority of cases, the benefits of anticoagulation um, outweigh the bleeding risk. Uh, 
this is the orbit score and again you you can see that depending on the uh, outcome score you can be categorized as being either low risk medium risk or high risk so that's in the top box um, and the yellow one actually gives you the number of um, uh, bleeds per 100 patient um, years as as a an example you can see the scoring below in in the gray box somewhat different to um, uh, has bled in that it's predicated not only around age but around hemoglobin is now included so we need a a, a, a full blood count on on patients um, bleeding risk of course is taken into account as um, importantly it, is renal function though this is predicated around EGFR as, a, uh, as opposed to estimated creatinine clearance and if there's any treatment or ongoing treatment with anti-platelets um, and this is has bled many will be more um, familiar with this there are more um, risk factors included here than there are within um, orbit and for me, what really is important is we that we use the individual components of either orbit or indeed of has bled as a means to modify um, um, bleeding risk. I, I, I like this um, chart because it divides into three the factors that increase bleeding risk. So you have modifiable, non-modifiable, or non-modifiable but treatment strategies help. So the non-modifiable previous uh, prior stroke bleeding or age. Sadly, we can't do anything about that. But the non-modifiable risks where treatment strategies can help are things like kidney disease. So the the addition of medications, um, RAS blockade, SGLT2 inhibition, um, uh, managing blood pressure as an example can alter um uh the course of um ckd and liver disease if it's related or or complicated by alcohol excess that might be an important factor that we can and modify and there there are the the modifiable risks managing blood pressure well that the, the lifestyle um factors that may be important again including um alcohol use and also we may be able to modify reversible causes of anemia by further investigation so this for me is important and, and in my mind um it's important that we don't use those um risk those total risk scores for chad's file score for orbit etc and use them comparatively um really for me the bleeding risk is around modifiable risk factors and that's the important part of it all this was a, it's an old study um, when uh, looking at the use of uh, warfarin it's uh, by freiberg it's probably 12 or 13 years uh, old and it looked at the follow-up of individuals who um, on a registry related to either their chad's fast score and their has blood and their has blood score and you can see on the y-axis it's an annual event rate and that's either having a stroke or an intracranial hemorrhage and both in the chads fask um, group or in the has bled group as you can see in chads fask it's down to a level of one or probably below that um, the, the risks of uh, intracranial hemorrhage related to oral anticoagulation come close to the level of stroke risk related to that very low chads VASC score in terms of benefit. And it's almost similar with, with um, has bled. And what this suggests to me is that um, in the majority of our patients down, certainly um, uh, two and above, but down to a level of one, there is still significant benefit to be gained by oral anticoagulation and it's important that we involve um, people in a discussion um, around this it's also worth remembering that this was done at a time when um, uh, this is a study with warfarin and, and we know that by using direct oral anticoagulants uh, uh, anticoagulants the risk of intracranial hemorrhage is significantly lower and we'll come to that shortly and this just really says the same thing in a different form of um, presentation. <laughs> 
So how do you balance up the, the risks of stroke prevention against bleeding risk? And you are comparing two different, completely different uh, areas. It's not apples and apples, it's apples with pears or apples with oranges, really. So, you know, you, you are trying to protect against an, an irre irre irreversible cerebral damage where, you know, you can't replace damaged brain. But of course, ble with bleeding risk, and in, in most um, cases, um, it's reversible. There's something that we can do about it to, to replace the blood that's lost. So we're not really comparing like with um, like. And of course, atrial fibrillation is an ideal situation for shared decision making. And we very much encourage that, you know, in people where we're considering anticoagulation, we should uh, come to a shared decision with patients around the use of anticoagulation for the, the reasons shared there. So switching increasingly, this is, um, and, and in fact, driven by the indicators that we see within the primary care network, IIF. Um, uh, we are seeing people being swapped um, from warfarin to a DOAC, or indeed from DOAC to DOAC with the um, procurement commissioning recommendations around the use of edoxaban as first line. So how do we do that? Um, worth looking up the resources from UCL partners um, who are an AHSN. Um, they have proactive care frameworks. It's some work led um, by both Matt Kearney and, and Helen Williams um, and some very useful guidance around considerations for switching. So when you're going from warfarin to DOAC, just remember it's important to consider is, is the warfarin being used um, uh, that you are considering swapping. Is it used? Is it being used for stroke prevention, um, excluding people who uh, are contra where there's a contraindication for the use of DOACs? Um, shared decision I've already talked about. The importance of um, checking body weight and other routine bloods. Renal function is important. We'll talk a little bit about how we assess renal function, particularly around dosing of, of DOACs um, shortly. And that's based around estimated creatinine clearance and the cockcroft galt equation. Which DOAC do we use in dose? So um, uh, it's important in our choice that we get the dose absolutely, absolutely right. And there is some guidance around when uh, after stopping warfarin, when we should initiate the um, DOAC INR less than 2.5, and it may have to be, the DOAC may have to be withheld for a period of time. The importance of written information, <clears throat> um, an alert card, and um, a point of contact should there be any issues. These are some EHRA recommendations, and these are on the left, these are kind of pragmatic recommendations that you may wish to, to use and apply to all your DOACs. So when an INR is less than two, you can start the DOAC immediately, two to 2.5. You can start same day or next day, 2.5 to three, rechecking the INR in a, a few days to check whether you can then start the DOAC and over three, um, not starting the DOAC until you're sure that INR has, has come down. And there are obviously for each to the DOACs, there, there are um, uh, licensed in in the SMPCs for the individual that you may wish to follow, and we, it's important that we point those out um, to you. Do I act to do act in stroke prevention suitable? Uh, so, you know, there are some uh, nuances around the individual DOAC um, use that we should be aware of. Shared decision making, we've covered having weight and up to date bloods, using estimated creatinine clearance, getting uh, whatever DOAC we're going to use, getting the dose right. Um, when stopping the existing DOAC and starting the alternative, um, you can continue the existing DOAC as normal on the day before the switch. Um, and initiate the alternative DOAC when the next dose is due on the day of the switch. Um, ensure the patient understands if dosing is once or twice daily, depending on the 
Like, so obviously, it's difficult if you're swapping from, say, Reverox um, to, say, a, a doctor ban, and the important that you share the information. And these are the, the dose adjustments. You can see it's much easier for uh, to dose adjust in some cases. Some of these algorithms around the four DOACs are easier than others, but all use an estimated uh, creatinine clearance, which is really, which is central to deciding on the dose. And it's really critical that um, we actually get the dose right. So should I consider using a DOAC in all my patients with non-valvular atrial, atrial fibrillation at high risk of stroke? This is the current NICE guideline. And as you will see, for a chance of ask score of two or above, we should be offering anticoagulation a DOA, with a DOAC in these patients. And that it's not just one of the DOACs that's recommended or two, as one might have, you might have been aware, was in the draft guideline, nice guideline, but it's fact we should have, we have the option of all four DOACs. So all four are recommended as options for anticoagulation and only if DOAC should be offering a vitamin K antagonist and even for those people who are currently appear to be well controlled on their their warfarin their time in the therapeutic range might be you know 65 percent as above as is recommended we should also be discussing with them the option of swapping to a doac why well I mean, the trials that were done were non-inferiority trials where the individual DOACs were compared to, to warfarin. There was a suggestion that there was greater benefit of DOAC over warfarin, but as I say, it, well, these were non-inferiority trials. But the big, big bit of news that came in each of these trials was the, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, which was basically halved if you gave a DOAC when compared to warfarin. And that's what's driven um, not only the, the recent NICE guidelines, but also the international guidelines around DOACs being favorable. When you look at warfarin, although we work around a 65% time in the therapeutic range, um, this is about percentage stroke survival, you can see depending on time in the therapeutic range. I must say, if, if I were on warfarin, I would not be happy if my time in the therapeutic range was only 65%, probably 90% or above, knowing that I had adequate anticoagulation for most of the time. But what's interesting here is the dotted line. And the dotted line is where um, individuals are not anticoagulated and what their risk of stroke actually is. And what it suggests is if, you, if you're only achieving times in the therapeutic range of 60% um, uh, or below, then you are actually doing harm by anticoagulating patients in, these, uh, in this situation. And that's by and large as a consequence of the risk of inter intracranial bleeding. So the absolute minimum should be 65% time in the therapeutic range. And we know that's difficult to achieve for a number of different reasons, whether we look at diet, concomitant drugs, we know it's a narrow therapeutic ring window. We know in a proportion of patients, it's just really difficult to, to manage them um, within that two to three, uh, an iron hour of two to three, and that may be related to genetic polymorphisms. And of course, there's frequent monitoring required. So I think the case is well made that DOACs are very much first line in people um, uh, when we're considering stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. Should I stop, continue or stop the antiplatelet now, a person with established vascular disease who develops AF? Again, I'm going to direct you to the UCL Partners um, uh, website, um, where they list, as you can see in, in this chart on the left hand side, the indication for antiplatelets and then the actions you need to take. Well, for primary prevention of CVD, then we shouldn't really be using antiplatelet um, prophylaxis in this particular group. Um, um, and of course, if someone develops um, atrial fibrillation, we know that antiplatelets are not recommended for um, stroke prevention. We know in secondary prevention, people may be on existing antiplatelet therapies. Um, where we are in a situation where we have people who are, and I, I hate using the word stable, having had some form of vascular event in the past, whether we're looking at stable 
uh, coronary heart disease, whether they've had a previous stroke of TIA or got PAD, then it's not unreasonable to stop the antiplatelet therapy if someone in that situation develops atrial fibrillation and then start um, uh, ADOAC. Um, there may be people who, in the previous 12 months, they may be on dual, sometime, uh, you know, antiplatelet therapy or even triple therapy. And in those patients where they develop atrial fibrillation, there needs to be a discussion with cardiologists around what is appropriate. And there will be occasional patients who are deemed to have complex uh, coronary artery disease where the um, uh, cardiologist may feel there is benefit of continuing an antiplatelet alongside anticoagulation in someone who develops atrial fibrillation. But again, it's important to seek advice from the cardiologist. And if you are using that, that dual therapy and antiplatelet and you're using um, uh, anticoagulation, you should be considering a PPI um, in addition. Anticoagulation and falls, this was, uh, uh, I mean, in many instances we are seeing, and as a primary care physician, I not infrequently see people, or have done less so recently, but people denied anticoagulation on the basis of either the risk of falling or actual fall. So what is that risk? And this was a study, it's a relatively small study, only 500 people, just looking at people deemed to be either high risk of falls, they'd had a fall, or they had some form of instability or those at low risk falls and they looked over um, uh, beyond the year at what the, the um, uh, time to uh, major bleeding was. And as you can see in both those groups, there's absolutely um, no difference in terms of the outcomes over a year, suggesting that really falls, that the level of risk related to falls, is, and we should uh, very seriously consider how relevant it is in um, when considering anticoagulation. Um, this was another study and it gives some of the, the um, uh, data and, and figures around uh, risks of fault relating to warfarin. And again, this is not a DOAC, so your, your, your risk of a subdural um, bleed is 0.04% in a year. And, and the risk of a subdural bleed in someone um, who falls versus someone who doesn't is about one point. 1.4 and the relative risk of a subdural bleed in a faller on warfarin and someone not warfarin is just over three and when you put those and look at those figures and it it suggests you'd need to fall 295 times in a year to outweigh benefits of the risk related to falls. Renal function, well, we know that renal function for drugs that are excreted either in, in part or solely through the kidneys is really important for the reasons outlined on, on the left hand side there. And it's important that we estimate the, the glomerular filtration, so that the EGFR, but in a proportion of patients, um, the recommendation is that we use creatinine clearance. And of course, we know that that's what's recommended when looking at DOAC dosing. Are, the, are EGFR interchangeable? And uh, is it interchangeable with estimated creatinine clearance in terms of uh, measuring severity of renal impairment? As you can see here, no, it is not. So, you know, a normal EGFR is deemed to be above 90, creatinine clearance, it's 80. Uh, mild um, uh, reduction in kidney function, 60 to 89. But again, creatinine clearance, it's lower again. So they are not interchangeable. And at the bottom, you can see the difference that will make. So an 85-year-old um, who has a serum creatinine with an estimated GFR of 32, depending on their weight, their estimated creatinine clearance can be very, very different, and that will influence the dosage at which we would give a DOAC. So we use uh, a serum creatinine and we know the patient's um, weight, and for the majority of patients, we will use their actual body weight in that calculation, unless they've recently lost weight or, or gained weight significantly. We can use a body weight from the last 12 months, but we know that in patients where their 
where they are significantly overweight, a BMI over 40 or over 120 kilograms, we do not get an accurate estimation of their estimated creatinine clearance using their weight. So in those patients, we would suggest that you use MDCalc um, to make your calculation because it uses an adjusted um, body weight in terms of estimating the creatinine clearance, as can be seen on the right hand side. So if we didn't use the adjusted body weight, we use the actual body weight. You can see the estimated creatinine clearance in this example, 71, with adjusted body weight. It's below 50. And for many DOACs we're going to use, it's going to be a smaller, the lower or reduced dose. And again, estimated creatinine clearance is very much central to those adjustments. Um, inappropriate dosing is not unusual where patients are actually being given the wrong dose. Sometimes it's because they're deemed to be frail, so we'll just give the smaller dose. Are there risks to that? Indeed, there are. So this was um, a study that showed, and particular, and in this study, it highlighted with a, um, a pixaban that there was a, almost a five fold increase in risk of stroke if you used the reduced dose of a pixaban. So getting the dose is correct. And as you can see here, follow up and review is important, particularly if the estimated creatinine clearance is reduced, as you can see in the top box. So lastly, um, it's not really a question, it's just a comment around stopping atrial, uh, stopping anticoagulation in someone with, atrial, with a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Um, and what it actually says is do not stop anticoagulation solely because AF is no longer detectable. Many patients are um, undergoing ablation therapy for their atrial fibrillation. Their atrial fibrillation may no longer be detectable, but we've shifted from saying, okay, you, sh you can stop anticoagulation if they've no symptoms or evidence of atrial fibrillation either after three or six months. Now we say, um, because we know that longer term monitoring in these people, we will often identify that they may be having subclinical episodes of atrial dysrhythmia that we should be considering um, continuing anticoagulation as an example in that particular group of indivi individuals. And again, you should base decisions around stopping anticoagulation on assessing stroke risk and bleeding risk using the scores that we have discussed. Thank you.